Good morning, good morning, good morning, Genesis Church. Is anybody excited to be in the house of God this morning? Yeah. Okay. All right. Stand with me this morning as we get ready to enter into worship. I want to read out of Isaiah chapter 6, super popular passage of scripture. It says, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, two covered his face, two covered his feet, and with two he flew. He, and one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Come on, uh, would you bow your head and let's pray this morning. God, we welcome your presence into this place. God, you are holy, you are awesome, you are worthy to be praised, God. Father, we pray that your glory would fill this place this morning, God. Inhabit the praises of your people, God. God, as the praises go up, let the glory come down. Be magnified in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Up the gates, swing wide the doors, the King of Glory's coming. Through city streets and living hearts, we see His Spirit moving. And now is Tell them my God is with us. Come prophesy that now's the time. Get ready, church. Let's rise up. And now his kingdom comes. Now his will.
Let's sing that again. So lift up your banners and practice your praise. Fill up your mouth with that glorious name, Jesus. Warrior Jesus. And shout all your people and dance through the town. Come celebrate, cause heaven's come down. Jesus, we welcome King Jesus.
I will not be shaken, God. I will not be shaken. I will not be moved. Thank you, Jesus. Can we just collectively raise our voice? Will you just sing to Jesus? Come on. Will you just sing to your Father? Holy Father. I don't care if you can hold a tune in a bucket. Come on. The, your daddy loves to hear you sing. Your dad loves to hear you sing. Come on. Sing to your dad. Come on. Sing to Jesus this morning. Father, you're worthy. Lord, bring the glory. Oh, 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 your holy Father, Jesus, your Jehovah Jireh, my provider, Jehovah Nisi, reign in victory. Sing holy. God, I pray that you would show me who you are, God, and lead me in your love, God. Lead me in your love, God. God, as I draw close to you, God, draw closer to me. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, I thank you for your people. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your power that I can just sing to you and no matter how I sound, it's like, it's like a sweet fragrance, God. Thank you, Jesus. As the praises go up, the glory comes down. I thank you, Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Awesome. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Man. Such an awesome atmosphere. We had a great time in the 9 a.m. service. Uh, it was awesome. Hey, uh, we don't have a ton of announcements, so I just wanted to give a quick shout-out to everybody that helped with the rummage sale over the past couple days. It was awesome. We had a great, great turnout, um, and uh, we are absolutely 100% going to get those kids to camp, and so we are excited about that. Yeah, you can give it up. <laughs> so... 
Yeah, um, don't have a ton of announcements. Um, so if you could, let's, let's just go straight to offering. Um, pull up that slide for me if you would. We want to remember to give this morning, and uh, you can give. Uh, we have a basket in the back there. Um, but you can also give by mail, P.O. Box 5695, Bloomington, Indiana, 47407. And then you can give online, igenesischurch.com slash give. Um, you guys are awesome. I know some of you are broke college students and or missionaries. Um, so I know that can be a little difficult. But trust God. Trust God in your giving and he will bless you. So um, if you take out your phones this morning... Um, we can do our pass the peace, our Anglican practice of passing the peace. Text somebody, let them know that you're thinking about them, that you love them, that they're awesome, and that uh, they're not doing life by themselves. Amen. So uh, how many of you have enjoyed the book of James? Yeah, it's been awesome. Super practical. So Nick's going to finish up chapter three this morning. And uh, yeah, we'll rock it out. All right. Well, maybe. There we go. Yeah, we're going to be in the book of James. Uh, I'm going to try to be quick because after I speak, I'm going to have uh, Ryan Brooks come and, and share some stuff with you just about their journey over the last couple of years and what God's doing in their family. Uh, so I'm going to try to be quick. But before we even get to the book of James, one thing I want to put on your radar, if you were here two weeks ago in person then you know that after, after service ended, uh, after the live stream ended, uh, it was announced that there is a family that the board and the search committee are feeling very, very strongly, like very good, very spirit-led about um, coming and, and probably being the next lead pastor, senior ministry leader here at Genesis. And they're going to be here. That family is going to be here two weeks from now on May 16th. And, um, and if, you were, if you were part of the Genesis online community or uh, part of that network, then, then you've had access to some content from them. I don't, I'm not saying their name right now because we are live streaming, and I'm, I'm personally not sure what conversations they have had with the church they're currently at, and I don't want things to get out in the wrong manner and, and feelings be hurt. And so uh, just know this, that that, that family um, is coming two weeks, May 16th. He will be preaching, and then directly after that, if you are a member of the church, uh, there's going to be a, uh, a, a meeting afterwards, and, and we'll vote and see where, where the Spirit is leading. And, um, and again, if you were here a couple weeks ago, then, then you heard uh, some, some updates on that, and I just want to reiterate, I've gotten to spend time with, with this family um, in person while they were visiting at one point, and then Mary and I have been spending time with them, just getting to know them through Zoom and, and FaceTime, and the more I hang out with them, the more I like them, and I think you guys will too. So I'm excited about seeing them again two weeks, May 16th, stay after if you're a member for that vote. Sound good? Everyone good on that? All right, so the book of James, we're going to be in chapter 3 before we get to the text. Quick story. So at the warehouse, my name is Nick, by the way. I'm some dude, and I work uh, here and also at the warehouse. And uh, at the warehouse, if you're not familiar, it's a, it's a rec center and a ministry center. It's a, it's a missional uh, a rec center. And, but one of the things that we did there for a long time up until COVID was every Wednesday morning, we would uh, have a gathering of local pastors for a pastor's prayer gathering. And, and it wasn't just prayer. Uh, they would go around and, and take turns doing Bible studies as well. And in many ways, I will just say that I was a little bit of a black sheep of the group. And uh, that was true in numerous ways. But I'll just, for the sake of the story, point to physical appearance. So um, <laughs> this, group, this group was full of uh, mostly older uh, pastors who have been in ministry 30, 40, 50 years, very professional, very distinguished. And so that room where we met, there were a lot of uh, blazers and sports coats, a lot of slacks and loafers, uh, and then there was Nick Pridemore, right? And so, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, in addition to like this being dressed up for me. Uh, I also, like, uh, after the meeting, I would have to go out and work in the warehouse, and so I was always wearing work clothes, just dingy clothes, um, and uh, one, of, one of the guys who was part of that group actually tried to run me off one time when I was showing up for work because he thought I was a vagrant trying to break into the warehouse. Uh, like, that's just, <laughs> that's just apparently the vibe I give off, and so 
Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm attending these meetings, uh, but um, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really speaking up a whole lot. Like I said, it's a room full of, of people who have been in ministry 30, 40, 50 years. And so I just kind of want to listen and, and glean and, you know, give them, give them room and space to, to share wisdom. And I'm just kind of there attending and not saying much. And like I said, they did these Bible studies, and it would uh, cycle around, and everyone did their, their little devotion. And so it got to, uh, I'd been there for several weeks, and the guy leading it said, hey, Nick, you've never done devotions for us yet. Would you do devotions next week? So I said, sure. And so uh, I'm there looking like this. My beard was probably more like mangly looking than it is now. Uh, but I, I get up to do this devotion, and uh, talking, talking about this, this passage in the New Testament uh, that Jesus did this really cool thing. And then, uh, I, I don't know, I think, it was, I think it was the Holy Spirit like helping me and making me smarter than I actually am. I, I, I all of a sudden realized this connection to something that happened in the Old Testament. And so I jump up and I run to the whiteboard and I start writing out this verse in, in Hebrew from the Old Testament and then reducing it down to the root words and then reconjugating it back out into the full structure so that I can point to, I, I think in this New Testament uh, uh, text, I, I think Jesus is actually appealing to Moses here and like drawing these connections. And, uh, and, and so I, I wrap up, and afterwards, this one pastor, very distinguished, uh, comes up to me with his sports coat and his slacks and loafers, comes up to me afterwards, and trying to be really complimentary, he goes, Nick, um, that, was, that was very surprising to me. You're, you're actually kind of smart, <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, and uh, it didn't bother me. I wasn't offended at all. I totally get it. Um, but I, I, I thought it would be funny if I like kind of poked at the way some implications from that statement might be offensive. Uh, and so I, I kind of jokingly was like, yeah, you really can't tell by looking at me, right? Serious as can be, he goes, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> like, that's, that's exactly the point I'm making. <laughs> And uh, so I was like, oh, cool. Thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, I appreciate that. Now, lest you think that I told that story for the sake of, like, puffing up and, and pretending to be smart, I'm not. I am not bright. So follow-up story, just to counterbalance that story. Um, at my house, in my bathroom, Mary replaced our toilet seat with a no-slam toilet seat. Do you guys know what those are? Uh, it's a really cool thing. It has like springs in the hinges, so like there's there's no there's no risk of the toilet seat just falling down when you don't want it to. Uh, you can actually leave it at a 45 degree angle if you want. I don't know why you would. That seems risky in any scenario. But um, uh, but anyway, you guys know the term muscle memory. So I've developed muscle memory for this very tense toilet seat. And so uh, like when I go to the bathroom in our house, I like flip it up. Uh, but it doesn't do that. It just kind of goes right, and then I like, slam it down, and it goes like that, but I don't, I don't apply that to there being a difference to public toilets now, and so I go into, I go into restrooms and go, <laughs> right, and it smacks off the back of the toilet and then falls down and scares everyone in the bathroom, and then here's the really dumb part, in the midst of 30 seconds, I forget about that whole thing, and when I'm done, I smack it down and just scare everyone in the bathroom, including myself, over and over, so that's just a counterbalance story for, I'm actually not smart, uh, I took some classes and that's about it. So the question in front of us today that James is asking is, who is wise and understanding among you? <laughs> how do you know when someone is wise and understanding, and how do you know when they're just a goober like me? Uh, let's read James chapter 3, starting in verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace, by those who make peace. All right, before we even get into dissecting the text, I, I need to sidetrack for a second and correct some, some misthinking, a large misperception we have about the book of James as a whole. See, I think that a lot of times we read this book in our English translations and it comes across as kind of stagnant and boring and, and we think of like Paul's letters as being really poetic and beautiful and, and oh, I could just read those all day long and, and they're just, just poetic and wonderful and then we get to James and, and it feels like this codex of laws, I 
like, do this, but don't do that. Do this, but don't do that. And, and we lose the reality of just how genuinely beautiful this text is. If you take, for example, just the idea of, of cross-referencing. You guys know, you guys know like, uh, a really great comedian will like, lace the same joke throughout his entire one-hour act, and then it's just stuck in your head. James does that. The way he cross-references and interlaces and repeats themes over and over again is absolutely brilliant. So, for example, this section today is about wisdom, which was introduced in chapter 1, verse 5, and then repeated in 1, 19, and then again in 3, 1, and now here at the end of chapter 3. The humility called for in 3.13 echoes 1.21 and the call to humbly accept the word planted in you. The fact that wisdom must be seen in action is piggybacking on the entire structural argument of chapter 2 verses 14 through 26 where faith must be seen in action. The bitter envy in 3.14 echoes the nastiness of the bitter water from 3.11. The warning against boasting in 3.14 calls back to uh, the, 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 the fact that mercy triumphs over judgment in 2.13 in the Greek New Testament. That's actually the same word, so that 2.13 could be translated, mercy is boasting over judgment. The fact that the false wisdom of 3.15 does not come down from above is a juxtaposition to the fact that 1.17 tells us every good gift does come down from above. The disorder mentioned in 3.16 is the same word used for the unstable man in 1.8 and the uncontrolled tongue in 3.8. It's all the same word in the, in the Greek New Testament. The, the fact that wisdom from above is full of mercy in 3.17 echoes the fact that mercy triumphs over judgment. And the fact that wisdom is impartial in 3.17 echoes the warnings against partiality in most of early chapter 2. You guys see how he just keeps cycling back around and bringing these things up over and over again, yet in this really creative way that it doesn't even feel redundant. It's just this beautiful uh, weaving and interlacing of the topics that he wants to talk about most. The cross-referencing, the, the interlacing is brilliant. Uh, in addition to that, he's, he's oftentimes hinting at intertestamental wisdom literature that's not part of our Bible, so, so we don't even pick up on that, but there's a lot in the book of James that is, that is kind of lightly hinting at intertestamental wisdom literature, and, and, and again, that's not inspired, or those, those, those other texts aren't inspired, but it, it points out just, just how smart James was and the, the study that he put into all of this, and then you look at just the actual literary structure. The use of alliteration and assonance to get the same sound stuck in your head over and over would, would make it memorable, make it so that even if you can't read or you don't have access to the text, you're going to remember what was said just because of the flow of it. The reality is you put all of these things together, the, the, the repeating of the same themes, the use of alliteration and, and assonance and the use of chiastic pyramids and linking words to move from one topic to another. The reality is if you were a Greek-speaking New Testament Christian, who heard this book read out loud in your church, it would sound like a spoken word performance. And you would just like just be dazed. It's so beautiful. So let, let's look at chapter 3, verse 17, one of our, one of our verses for today, for example. Um, this, is, this is a transliteration of what it, uh, what it would sound like in the Greek text. This isn't the actual Greek text. It's a transliteration. But, but in this text, he spends the first three quarters of the sentence just, just repeating the E sound over and over and over. And then in the last quarter, he switches to the A sound. And it creates this, this, this beautiful phenomenon where this verse, if you spoke this language, this verse would immediately be memorable the first time you heard it. It would sound like this. Hey, Dea Nothen, Sophia Proton, Men, Hagne. Can you hear just the rhythm and the beauty and the assonance and alliteration in that? Guys, this is, this is not just a boring list of rules. Scholars agree that when it comes to style and, 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 and uh, uh, just the literary quality, this is, one of the, this is one of the most beautiful literary texts in the entire Bible. I think we need to change the way we approach James and, 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 and look at this as this really beautiful text. Yes, it's practical. Yes, it's full of wisdom. Yes, it does have commands and imperatives. But, but this is not a dry list of do's and don'ts, guys. This is literary gold. All right, enough nerding out on that. Let's look at the text. <clears throat> All right, so the major theme that, uh, that James is working on here is wisdom, right? And, and it may seem like he's changed subjects a little bit, 
Um, because in chapter 3, the first half of chapter 3, he's been talking about the way we speak and, and the things that come out of our mouth. And he's talking about the sinfulness of, of speaking destructively about or to someone. And now he seemingly shifts to the topic of wisdom. But for two reasons, I don't think this is a shift at all. I think, I think he's continuing in the same flow of thought. The first reason is this. In Jewish thought, wisdom and the restraint of your tongue are inseparable ideas. In Jewish thought, it doesn't matter how much data you know, it doesn't matter how great you are at teaching, it doesn't matter how poetic you can speak, it doesn't matter how, how appealing you can be from a stage, it didn't matter uh, how much you had climbed the ranks of your field, it didn't matter how much of an expert you were seen as, if you couldn't control what came out of your mouth, you were not wise. That was, that was just point blank. In fact, if you go to the next slide there. Here's a short list, a non-exhaustive list of the times in the book of Proverbs, the book of wisdom, the, the primary book of wisdom in the Old Testament, where, where we see uh, restraint of the tongue, not just mentioned as a virtue, but distinctly tied to a necessary part of wisdom. That's a non-exhaustive list of the times that those two ideas are sewn together. So I don't think he is switching topics. Second reason is this. And with this reason, I'm about to tell you why our passage for today does not apply to you and why it does. All right, you'll see in a second. I think the second reason is this. I think what James is doing here is actually going back to chapter 3, verse 1, where he made this introductory, uh, pivotal statement, not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. So he makes that statement, not many of you should try to be teachers, and then uh, in, in the following verses, in verses 2 through 12, he's talking about how being qualified to be a teacher is revealed by the quality and the content of our speech, and now in verses 13 through 18, he's talking about how being qualified to teach is revealed by the quality of our actions and behavior. So here's why it doesn't apply to you, because I recognize that most of you sitting out there are not longing to be teachers. I recognize that for a lot of you, you're sitting here thinking, uh, you know, that command, not many of you should, should strive to become teachers, check, got it. I don't want to be the one on stage. I don't, I don't want to have the microphone. If, if through some series of events I were to go to my mom, Kim, and say, hey, there's this weird scenario and you have to preach next week, uh, she would move out of the state. Like, it would just be a done deal, like, not going to happen. I understand that for a lot of us in the room, we don't have this great desire to become a teacher, and so there's this thinking that maybe this doesn't apply to me. If this whole chapter is about qualifications to teach, I don't want to teach. But there's actually more to it than that. So here's why it does apply to you. We have to keep in mind that this is a Jewish author writing to a Jewish community in a Jewish context. He's, he's writing to the, the scattered, the diasporic church uh, that, that is predominantly Jewish in the Near Eastern world. And so we have to look at these statements in that culture. What was going on? Like, why, why did James even feel the need to say, hey, slow down, not so many of you should be trying to be teachers? Why would that even be a thing that he had to say? See, in that culture, to be a teacher or a rabbi was the most common, if not the only means available to most people to reach for significance. Think about it, like in our culture, we have so many means of being known, of building a platform, of making a name for ourselves, of being somebody, but, but in that culture, it, it wasn't like that, and so they didn't have sports stars, they didn't have movie stars, they didn't have musicians that, that were world famous, they didn't have politicians, they didn't have professional influencers, they didn't have podcasters, they didn't have authors that were, that were world renowned, they didn't have bloggers, they didn't have experts in particular fields that were interviewed on national TV by nationally known newscasters. They didn't have YouTube and they didn't have TikTok. And so if you wanted to be known, if you wanted to be significant, if you wanted to be someone who, who you felt like you were influential and people knew your name and you were making some difference in the world, Rabbi, that's the means that you had. There was this saying during that time that, that if, if a scenario arose where your parents and your rabbi were both being held ransom, and you only had money to save one, save your rabbi. Because while your parents led you into the life of this world, only your rabbi will lead you into the life of the next world. Like that's how revered it was to be a teacher. That's how important it was to be a teacher. They got the seats of honor. They got the best treatment. They, they were the closest thing to celebrities as that culture had. What this verse is really all about 
in addressing teachers is this. Here's why it applies to us. Even if you don't want to be a teacher, we are all reaching for significance. There's, there's something inside each and every one of us that wants to know, I, I matter, I'm significant, I have made some difference somehow. And for some others, it might even be bigger, like there's this, this craving and this desire to be, to be known, to have a platform, to build something big, to be, to be known not just among my group of friends, but, but, but to be known out there in society. I want to be somebody. I want to be known and significant, and I want my life to be meaningful. And that's what this verse is all about, and that's why it applies to us. What this passage is really addressing is, who are you willing to be in your quest for significance? So let's, let's put it in practical terms. Who are you willing to be to get that promotion? Like if, if your quest for significance is through professional achievement and I'm going to reach to the top of my field and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to climb up the ranks and that's how I'm going to be significant and that's what I'm going to be known for is that guy was awesome at his job. What are you going to do? Who are you willing to become to get there? And if that doesn't happen, if you go up for a promotion and your coworker gets it instead of you, how do you respond? What does that do inside of you? If you try to get into this particular program or this particular school or go up for a particular scholarship, who are you willing to be to obtain that? And if you don't get it, what does that do inside of you? Who does it make you become if you don't get that? Who are you willing to be to be the best in your field, to, to build a platform, to be known? Or, or we can break it down to an even more personal level. So like if when you're with your group of friends, you, you have this, this constant feeling like that one friend just always shines, and I wish I was that friend. And like everyone in the friend group seems to shine, and they seem to click together, and I always feel like I'm just kind of on the outside of this group, like I'm allowed to be here, but I'm not a significant part of the group. Who are you willing to be to change that scenario? Your posts, your online content doesn't get the likes and the shares that you want or you think it deserves, and so what... How are you going to change that? Who are you willing to become to get the attention that you think you need to get the significance that you're craving? That's what this passage is all about. In your quest for significance, in your attempting to be somebody, are you going to go down the, the route of the wisdom of the world or do you go down this other route? And so Blumberg and Camille say it like this. this. This passage is for all of us. Not only the leaders of a church, but every Christian ought to seek both knowledge about God as well as practical, moral, and spiritual insight. James is asking his congregations to evaluate themselves and discern who the truly wise ones among them are, who both know what is right and practice it. All right, so with that context in mind, we're going to start going through this verse by verse. And that's, that's the idea that I want you to have in your head as we go through this. I don't want you to be sitting there checking out because I don't want to be a teacher, so none of this applies to me, and I'm not a philosopher, and so the whole concept of wisdom isn't that important to me. Uh, that, that's not the case. Uh, if you're sitting in this room and there's anything in you that wants to be somebody, that wants to achieve something, that has any goal in life, this passage is for us, and I want you to be thinking through that as we go through this. 3.13 says, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his work in the meekness of wisdom. All right, real quick, um, a lot of scholars think that, that that passage, or that, excuse me, that phrase, a lot of scholars think that phrase, wise and understanding, is not just a generic uh, description. Those aren't just a couple of adjectives thrown together. Um, a lot of scholars think that that was actually a technical term applied only to those who teach. So it would be kind of similar to the way we use PhD. Like, who has a PhD among you? Like, it's not just a description, but it's actually a technical term applied to those who have gone through rigorous training and have demonstrated they are qualified to teach. And so that's part of why I think he's reaching all the way back to chapter 3, verse 1 here, because this is probably a technical term for teachers. So he introduces this subtopic of wisdom as applied to being a teacher or for us as applied to seeking significance and he says that the path to significance is going to look like something. And it's either going to look like the wisdom of the world or it's going to look like the wisdom that comes down from heaven. Those are your choices. And then he, he offers us these, these two wisdoms, a picture of the two wisdoms. So let's get into that. The wisdom of the world, chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. 
So we read that, and right off the bat, bitter jealousy uh, just just rings like uh, the, that's a vice. Like every like we read that, and no one's like, eh, I never knew being bitterly jealous was bad. No, like that's obviously something that we stay away from, or at least should. Uh, that's a pretty obvious vice, not a virtue. But then we get to selfish ambition, and most of us in the West have been raised with this idea that ambition is good, right? And and so I, I, I want to say that it is. There's nothing wrong with being ambitious or having ambition. So I don't want you to, to read this or to, to hear this sermon today and, and walk away thinking that ambition in itself is inherently bad. And I, I don't want you to, to walk away thinking that, that it's, it's somehow wrong if your approach to this is like, oh, I'm, if I'm going to take this class, then I want to do the best I can in it. No, that's good. You should be that. Or I don't want you to walk away thinking that it's somehow wrong for you to have this, this kind of ethic that, well, this is my job. I'm going to work at it as hard as I can and be good at it. No, 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 that's good. You should have that perspective. It's selfish ambition that is up for question here. Ambition that is not aimed at bringing glory to Jesus. Ambition that is not aimed at building something of value. That is not aimed at expanding the kingdom. Ambition that is aimed solely at what do I want and how do I get it at all costs? Who am I willing to push down to get what I want? So he's, he's talking about this. I love this, uh, this description from Blomberg and Camille. He's talking about the word selfish ambition. He says it's combined with selfish ambition, a word commonly used in settings of sectarian rivalry or partisan politics. The image appears of people in angry competition, undermining one another and each other for their own rights. And so, so he offers us these, these two primary problems with the wisdom of the world. There's, there's a way to go about being significant, and the world says the best way to do it is to be bitterly jealous, to look around and to say, I want what they have, and I, I wish I was getting what they're getting, and I see them enjoying that, and I want that, and selfish ambition to evaluate, okay, now that I know what I want, now that I've looked around and jealously discerned what I want, like how am I going to go about getting it at all costs? And, and it's really interesting to me that, that James equates that. The word he uses here for selfish ambition is a word most primarily used to describe the actions of politicians. And James says, don't be like that. Uh, that's pretty telling to me, right? And, and so, so he offers these two, these two primary problems with the wisdom of the world, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. And here's a cool thing, or interesting thing anyways. Um, in, this, in this passage, um, when it says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, if you have these things in your hearts, in the Greek New Testament, the you there is plural. They have a way to construct uh, pronouns and everything else that would make it plural. And so the, the you in that is actually plural, but the word hearts is singular. And so there's this implication here this, this idea of this being a collective problem in the church, that James isn't warning a few people that he's heard about, but James is commenting on a collective problem in the collective heart of the church. If you all have these things in your heart, if we all have this in our heart, this was a problem in the culture of the New Testament church, that, that too many of them across the board were striving for significance in the wrong ways. They were striving for significance, but in the way the world told them to get it. And it says, these two things bring about disorder and every vile practice. Here's the problem with the wisdom of the world. The wisdom of the world, what it produces in us, disorder and every vile practice, these things um, aren't just things, they're not just traits that God kind of doesn't care for. They're not, just, they're not just not the best things for us to be, but they are, in fact, the antithesis of the very character of God. I like this quote from Tasker in the, in the New Testament commentaries, Tyndale New Testament commentaries. He says this, God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. But where there is bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, there is confusion or disorder. The whole mental outlook is thrown into disorder. The understanding is darkened, and this spiritual instability is reflected in the instability of human society. Similarly, God is wholly antipathetic to evil. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. But where there is bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, there is every evil work. See, the problem with following the wisdom of the world in our quest for significance isn't that it makes us unlikable people. It's not that it produces in us traits that God says, well, I wish they would be different. The problem is that these traits are the antithesis of the very character of God. They're not morally neutral. They're not just obnoxious but innocuous. They are the opposite of who God is. But there's a different side of the coin. There is a way that James says to 
Seek after significance that is appropriate. Chapter 3, verses 17 through 18 says this. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. All right, quickly, James gives us in this section eight characteristics of the wisdom from above. All right, so, so we're seeking, we're seeking uh, significance. We're trying to be somebody. We're trying to figure out who we are and, and what meaning we have in this world. And, and in, in the quest for that, there's a way that the world tells us is good, but here's the way that looks like the kingdom of heaven. Number one, that way is pure. It's the word hagnos. It means holy. Uh, it, it doesn't have to do with ceremonial purity like the, the covenant, uh, the, the Mosaic covenant. It's this internal moral purity. I like how Ropes puts it in his commentary says, nothing which shows itself as half good and half bad can be accounted wisdom. Whew. That's pretty deep when you think about it. Nothing that is half good but half bad can be called wisdom. Wisdom from above is not mixed with the wisdom of the world. It's singularly focused on God and his kingdom. It doesn't wrestle with mixed loyalties. It doesn't say, I will obey in this, but it will actually help me if I do this. That, that looks like the world. See, I, I see this. I see this in... The church a lot. Let me, let me throw out one quick example, and then this is kind of a hot topic, so let me step aside, let me step aside from the pulpit and, and say this. All right, this is Nick Pridemore speaking. This is not me unpacking scripture. This is me speaking. Uh, one way that I see this in my personal view is happening is as follows. A, a, a surprisingly hot topic among clergy right now is the ethic of copying other people's sermons. And the idea being... Uh, if, I, if I just preach someone else's sermon, if I copy and paste and I download someone else's sermon, that's going to free me up to do so much more kingdom work. And so it's really wise for me to do that. It's really wise for me to, to, uh, to put off my responsibility to study and spend time in the scriptures and to hear from Jesus a word for my people. It's, it's actually wise for me to put that off because now I'll have more time to do more kingdom stuff. See, that to me appears as mixing Wisdom from above with wisdom from below, which isn't wisdom at all. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> Hagnos. It is not mixed with uh, wisdom from the world. It does not have mixed loyalties. The phrasing here, first of all pure, and then everything else, is a hierarchical statement. That's not a chronological statement. It's just not, hey, here's the order I'm listing these in. But it's hierarchical, meaning in James' mind, purity is the chief trait of God's wisdom, and all the subsequent traits flow out of wisdom's purity. Number two, it's peaceable. I will talk much more about this later, the idea of peace. But, but suffice for now to say, uh, godly wisdom produces peace. It makes down here look a lot more like heaven. Uh, it, it, it produces peace around us. Number three, it's gentle that word for gentle is the same word group that is often translated as meek in the New Testament. So uh, if your translation says meek uh, in, in certain places, it's this same idea. Meekness is, you guys have probably heard that colloquial definition of meekness, that meekness is not weakness, it's power under restraint. You guys have heard that before? So, so meekness and, and being gentle is not, is not being weak, it's not the inability to be otherwise, it's the decision, it's the choice to be gentle. It's the opposite of being harsh, domineering, and damaging. Number four, it's open to reason, compliant, willing to consider other perspectives. Bottom line is, wisdom from above is teachable. Now, when I say teachable, I need to clarify, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of people I've interacted with who would see themselves as teachable, but what they mean by that, what, when, when certain people say, I'm very teachable, what they mean is I'm very curious and I read a lot of books, and, and if, someone, if someone knows a lot about a topic that I'm interested in, I will listen to them. That's not being teachable, that's being curious. Being teachable is learning from someone on something that you think you already know. It's, it's being willing to say, maybe I actually don't have all of this figured out, and maybe that other perspective that I signed off as, as wrong, maybe there's actually something to that. That's being teachable, open to reason. 
It's full of mercy. Next, full of mercy. According to uh, Richard Lawrence, the Greek word used for mercy here was originally just this idea of an inner feeling of sympathy that you feel when you see someone else suffering. However, by the time of the New Testament, the word had evolved in usage to to be more action-oriented. So it meant feeling uh, feeling for someone enough that you were moved to action to help them. That's that's the the definition of, of mercy in the New Testament. The New Testament follows that idea. So mercy is not just feeling sorry for someone, it is reaching out to meet a need without considering the merit of the person who receives the aid. Next, it's full of good fruit. I'm getting quite a bit of ringing up here. I don't know if I'm the only one hearing that. Um, It's full of good fruit. So I'm, I'm not going to spend time on this. We've, we've spent time in, in previous weeks talking about Jesus' words in Matthew 7 uh, about bearing good fruit, bearing bad fruit. You can go cross-reference Paul's list of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. But those kinds of things, when you read that list, those are the kinds of things that are visible in the life of someone who is pursuing wisdom from above. It is impartial. True wisdom, the kind from heaven, does not make different kinds of decisions based on the superficial characteristics of the people involved, point blank. And lastly, it is sincere. Very simple. Oh, wait, did I skip one? Yeah, which one did I skip? Impartial, Impartial. yeah. Um, True wisdom, the kind from heaven, yeah, I said that, Uh, doesn't make different decisions based on superficial characteristics of the people involved. And then lastly, it is sincere, very simple. That word means not a hypocrite, a nupocritus, not a hypocrite. So true, uh, true wisdom lives out who it is all the time. It doesn't change who it is based on who is around. So that's his description of of what wisdom from above looks like. Now, I want to point out something cool. Remember a couple weeks ago when I said that a lot of people don't like the book of James because they they think that it doesn't have a high Christology, that it doesn't talk about Jesus enough, it doesn't talk about the cross, it doesn't talk about about the person of Jesus very frequently, and so a lot of people think there's no Christology. And I argue that James actually does have a very high Christology. It just looks different. So whereas Paul describes and explains Jesus, James simply repeats Jesus. Check this out. Look what David Platt points out in his commentary, Exalting Jesus in James. Consider how the characterizations of wisdom in James are evident in the Beatitudes. James says that wisdom is pure. Jesus said, blessed are the pure, for they will see God. James says that wisdom is peace-loving. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called the sons of God. James says that wisdom is gentle or considerate. Jesus said, blessed are the gentle. They will inherit the kingdom of earth, or they will inherit the whole earth. Um... James says that wisdom is compliant and submissive. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. James says that wisdom is full of mercy. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, they will be shown mercy. James says that wisdom is full of good fruit. And Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled. You guys see how amazing it is that his whole description is just repeating what Jesus already taught. James has a very high Christology, but he's not explaining Jesus. He's just repeating Jesus. Verse 18, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. All right, you've heard it said before from this platform. You've heard me talk about it, Tim, Leslie. You've heard us all talk about the fact that biblical peace is not merely a lack of conflict, but it stems from this Jewish idea of shalom. Shalom is best translated as wholeness or completeness. It's the idea that, that not only is there a lack of peace, but, but, but more importantly, things are functioning as they should. Things are, things are operating in their created design. There is a sense of wholeness and completeness. This is right. And we've also said that, that in this idea of shalom, for us as Jesus followers, that there's very much an essential inner aspect so that, so that as Jesus followers, I can have peace even in the midst of conflict even in the midst of adversity, because for us it is primarily an internal reality. And that's true. But we have to be careful that we don't swing the pendulum so far in our understanding of peace. We, don't, we, we can't swing the, the pendulum of definition so far over here that it becomes only an inner intrinsic feeling and bears no good to those around me. So, so biblical shalom, biblical peace... Is, is not a willingness or ability to be unbothered by the chaos around me. That's not biblical peace. 
I can, have, I can have peace in the midst of conflict, but biblical peace is not watching everyone's life around me just be in ruins and watching everything around me uh, burn to the ground, but being like, well, I'm okay, though. I'm fine. I have peace. That's not biblical peace. That is being unaware of your surroundings. Biblical peace is this. It is, it is striving to creating on the outside of me that which Jesus has put on the inside of me. So, so yes, it begins with this inner reality. The, the peace of God is something that begins in me. It's something that Jesus gives me, right? He, he left his peace with us, and so I have that inside of me. But, but my task now is not to just enjoy that inside of me, not to just hang on to that and be like, I have the peace of Jesus, so everything else can just burn down. But my task now is to create around me and outside of me that which Jesus put in me. I like this quote from Richard Lawrence. He says, God's peace may be an inner experience, but the wholeness that is suggested by shalom or erne, which is the Greek word, is also visibly expressed by the believing community. Among God's people, peace means that hostility has been replaced by unity. It means order and harmony. It means a commitment to harmony that is as much the Christian's calling as is holiness. Here's what's interesting about James. Uh, this letter was written by James, obviously. The, the two times that we see James as a prominent figure in, in a story in the New Testament, there are two times in the book of Acts where James becomes a central character of a narrative. Acts chapter 15 and Acts chapter 21. In both of those occasions, this, the, the narrative is describing a, a time where the church is a, on the brink of splitting up and there are warring factions and there's this group saying that this is truth and this group saying that this is truth. And both times we see James rise to a prominent leadership role in the narrative. He is trying to bring peace and unity to warring factions in the church. He put into practice what he said. Now, I'm going to close with this. I had some stuff written down about how none of this means that we don't uh, resist sin, and none of this means that we don't push back on injustice. None of this means that, that in our attempt to be peaceful people, in our attempt to be peaceable and gentle, that doesn't mean that we just turn a blind eye to injustice. That's, that's not what this is about. I don't have time to get into it, but trust me, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what James is saying. But for the sake of time, I'm going to move on to this last thought. Here's my last thought. You can't opt out of out of this. You can't opt out of this teaching. So, so at the beginning, I explained that it's primarily aimed at teachers, and you might be saying, you know, I'm, I'm not really trying to be a teacher. And then I explained that it's actually, on a deeper level, it's about the quest for significance and meaning and being known. And so you might be saying at that point, well, I'm okay with even not really being known. I'm, I'm okay with just always being in the shadows. I'm okay with, with uh, just, just living a very simple, humble life. I don't need significance. I'm very happy just, just being. So, so none of this applies to me. Point blank, there, there is no person who claims to love Jesus who gets to opt out of the desire for wisdom. You can't say, I love Jesus, and simultaneously say, I don't care about wisdom. And here's why. I don't know if you guys realize this, but all of his descriptions of what wisdom is, it's just describing Jesus. Jesus is pure. Jesus is peaceable. He's, he's the one who brings peace. Jesus is gentle. He said, he said, take my yoke on you and learn I'm gentle. Jesus is, is, is open to reason and compliant. And that sounds weird, saying that, that the God of the universe is open to reason and compliant. But think about this. What's, what's more open to reason than saying, you know what, I'm going to step down out of heaven and put on skin so I can see what it's like to be you. That's pretty darn open to reason. Jesus is impartial. Jesus is sincere. Jesus, Jesus is all of these things. And so, so we can't say, I love Jesus, but, but I don't care for any of these things. That's as foolish as me saying, you know, I really love my wife Mary, but, but when, listen, when it comes to like brilliant, beautiful women who grew up in California and then moved to Oregon and then, you know, came to Missouri and then Indiana and they have cool tattoos on their head, I, I don't care about those. Like, what sense does that mean? I just described my wife. So I can't say, I love this, but I don't care about that. Listen, if, if you want more evidence of the fact that this is applicable to all of us, Colossians 2, verse 3, talking about Jesus in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. 1 Corinthians 1, 24, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God. Wisdom put into flesh. 
John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God, and the Word was God. That word, Word, is the Greek word logos. It's this, it's this Greek conception of the rationality and the wisdom that makes the world function. So that could, that could be translated, in the beginning was the wisdom, and the wisdom was with God, and the wisdom was God. And then later down, the wisdom put on flesh and walked among us, right? Which, by the way, uh, talking about intertestamental wisdom literature, this is not scripture. I want to be clear about that. This is not scripture, but it's still really cool. Uh, the book of Baruch chapter 3 says this, which was written uh, about 200 years before Jesus, says, wisdom appeared on earth and lived among human beings. Does that sound familiar at all? And the word became flesh and lived among us? Yeah, John was actually piggybacking on intertestamental wisdom literature. Super cool. But the bottom line is, we don't get to say, I love Jesus, but I don't care about wisdom. If you love Jesus, you care about wisdom. Now, here's why I wanted Ryan to come talk today. If you want to go ahead and head this way, um, everything that we just described, I see in, in Ryan, uh, the good parts, not the bad parts, not the selfish ambition. I want to be clear. Um, <laughs> I've, I've gotten to know Ryan over the last couple of years. He's been here for a couple of years, and, and, and I, I, we go out and mountain bike together and uh, gotten to have lunch with, with uh, Ryan and Kathleen, and, and just, man, I love these people. They're incredible, and I've, I've really enjoyed getting to know Ryan out on the mountain bike trails and just hear not only part of his story, but just, just being around him. If you've been around Ryan, you know, like, that's a blessing. I don't have to say any more. Being around Ryan is good, right? And so... In reading this and studying for this and knowing, like, we'd been talking about having Ryan come share a little bit of their story and what God has done and where God's brought them in the last few years. And then in reading and studying this and, and being, like, reading through this and, like, oh, man, wisdom from above looks like pure. It, it looks like being singularly focused on the kingdom of God. Oh, I know someone. It looks like being peaceable. It looks like, it looks like not being contentious. And it looks, like, it looks like not stirring up strife, but working towards peace and trying to bring real peace to scenarios. And I was like, man, I know someone. And, and I, down the list I went, and, and I just want to honor Ryan and hold him up. And, and not, to, not to put him on a pedestal. Like, we're all flawed humans in here, right? But like Paul saying, follow me as I follow Christ, in, in, in the realm of of wisdom that comes from above and what it looks like, I, I can hold Ryan up and say, I want to follow him as he follows Jesus because he's doing it right. And so I just wanted you to share some of your story with the church, and then afterwards, you're going to lead us in communion. But before, before I turn it over to him, because you're just going to close us out with communion, uh, we're taking up a love offering for Ryan and his family today. Uh, they, he'll, he'll share this, but they're, they're heading out of town soon, and we want to send them off with a blessing. We want to send them off with something tangible that says, we at Genesis love you and believe in you, and, and we are supporting you. And so there are two baskets back there. One of them is marked for his family. If, you're, if you want to give online or or PayPal, you can do that as well. If you need to mail in your check, you can do that. Uh, same web address, same mailing address. Just make sure that you annotate somehow, put a note on it that this is for the Brooks family. And uh, if you're putting something back there, make sure it goes in the correct basket. But man, I love you. It's an honor to know you. And Ryan's going to close us out here in a little bit. So give it up for Ryan. Um. You'll see from the story, God's wisdom doesn't make any sense. Um, we, we've had just a, a, a really crazy four years. Um, so my wife and I were uh, Chi Alpha directors in Kentucky. Um, had some really great stuff happening. If, if, if you're not familiar with Chi Alpha, that's 90% uh, of the room <laughs> right now. Um, <laughs> If you're not familiar with Chi Alpha, it's a, it's a ministry to uh, universities, um, and uh, we met Jesus through Chi Alpha in 97 and 98, and then became student leaders, and then small group leaders, and then eventually uh, started leading the ministry that led us to Jesus. Um, so we were doing that, and some really, some really great things were happening. Um, our, our students would go on a trip to the lake, and then some of them would come back baptized because they're baptizing each other. And, and um, you know, toward the, toward the very end of our time in Kentucky, I, I baptized a student who, who had become more like a daughter to me, but she was um, um, given to Hindu gods in the temple at birth. And... Um, she just, she just met Jesus, you know, and I baptized her in the hot tub at the wreck. <laughs> like, 
just good stuff, you know, and in the middle of these good things happening and uh, us feeling more fulfilled in ministry than ever before, I think, um, and, and certainly enjoying Chi Alpha more than we ever had. I mean, it was really good. I took Jesus out to lunch to one of my favorite places called the Burrito Shack, and um, I sat across him, and I just kind of took him on a date and asked him what he wanted to do, and just became really clear that um, he was asking us to step away from our campus for a year and to leave our campus ministry in the hands of our students who are very capably uh, leading each other to Jesus at this point. Uh, we didn't feel like uh, that was crazy. It was just Jesus. And, um, and we, we needed a sabbatical. We were exhausted, myself especially, um, just some things leading up to that. And so as a result of that lunch with Jesus, like we sold almost everything we owned um, in the process. We really felt like God asked us to even sell our house, and so we sold our house. We moved into a bus. It's still parked behind Genesis. If you want to take that way out, um, Gus, the bus is back there. Um, and so we, we, uh, we talked to our national director, and we're like, hey, we, we need a sabbatical, but we want to learn. We want to see what other Chi Alphas around the country are doing that are healthy and good. And so see, he said, well, you got to go to Turlock, California, and you got to go to Bloomington, Indiana. So in that order, we went to Turlock, California. Um, we learned some great stuff there. We met some great people, and our lives started to fall apart. We didn't know why. And at the same time, we get word that our, the only church that we had ever known, our, our only pastor, had planted their own campus ministry and was now recruiting our Chi Alpha students to be a part of what they had planted. Um, and then they selected a board of all of my best friends on the planet just to try to hurt us. Just It got really gross and bad and legal. Um, there were threats of lawsuits um, to take all of our assets, all of our support, um, to take our campus house. It's just really bad. So um, I'm also serving at this time as the state director for Kentucky. And so I'm having conversations at the, at the national level about what to do with this mess. This guy in, in Kentucky has really gotten himself into it, and it just happens to be me also. <laughs> and, and so, I mean, it was, it was just brutal. And, and I'm also tasked with cleaning it up because it's a guy in my state. Uh, so we moved back across the country. We're like, well, maybe it's time to go to Bloomington um, and and. You know, a big part of the, uh, the reason why we've p been talking about me sharing is because I just want to thank you people. Uh, if you're a part of Chi Alpha, even if you weren't there then, you're just a part of this community that just gave us a big hug when we got here. And um, if you're a part of Genesis, same. Um, I, there were so many people that, that without even knowing it, you know, um, just would be nice to us. <laughs> And coming out of this really nasty, um, gross situation, just pe people being nice to you just feels so good. And so we came here, and it, it was just like God giving us a big hug. It was, you know, you read in the Old Testament sometimes about these safe cities where people who got themselves in trouble, they would have to go to a safe haven kind of city. And that's what Bloomington became and has been for us. And so... Um, I, you know, I had a conversation with the Chi Alpha National Director, and he was like, that, that place is toxic. You cannot go back there. You just go unbolt the sign out of the front yard. We, d we don't want Chi Alpha's name attached to what is going on there. We, which is um, total wisdom, but that was where we met Jesus. That's where we had served. That's where we, had, we had literally inherited <laughs> this ministry. And so much good it was happening there. So much good was happening all over the state. It was like wherever we went, like whatever we poured ourselves into, God just blessed it. It was so good. And now I'm directing the state of Kentucky while living in Indiana <laughs> and like trying to find out what's next. And um, so um, as a result of that big mess, um, 
we lost a lot of our, our missionary support too because people just didn't want to be attached to this scandal thing that was happening. And so just right as our, our missionary support dropped off, I got a phone call from an old friend and he said that they had just won the contract at IU. Would I work for him? Which I did and just almost to the penny like matched all of the money we had lost. God just took care of us. So I started carrying, I started delivering rental fridges at IU. Some of you have worked with me um, carrying fridges up stairwells. And, um, but you know, God, God was doing stuff deep in us uh, as a result of getting out of all the toxicity and as a result of, of being in this church that just, um, it's really hard to twist, twist what scripture says when you're breaking it down into the Greek. It, it's, it's really difficult for a church like this to teach something that's not there as you're going verse by verse by verse through the Bible. And so we're in this place that is just so full of health and wonderfulness and going through such a mess. And, you know, the staff of Chi Alpha on campus is just loving us and giving us a place to serve and and we're we're realizing that um that our our calling as missionaries um was not nearly as important as our call to Jesus and there was there was a, a speaker one of the very first nights I ever went to Chi Alpha here um and she ta- she was a missionary um and she talked about how Jesus called her to himself first. And I think that goes right along with everything that Nick has been pulling out of the scripture today is that, that no matter what your calling in life is, no matter how God wants to use you, your calling in, li- in life is to Jesus, number one. And so I'm carrying these fridges around on campus and getting this in my heart like I'm realizing it doesn't matter what I do it doesn't matter who I'm around it doesn't matter what is done to me or what is said about me I'm God's and so I'm carrying these fridges around on campus like laughing (laughs) just hysterically laughing and I, I, I just know that there are students still on campus today that are just like well that crazy fridge guy I mean I just it was just hilarious, but I was just getting it in my heart like I was a son, you know, and nothing else mattered. I don't care. It didn't matter. And um, and then God asked us to lay all that down, too. And so so I called the, the superintendent of Kentucky, and I'm just like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I got, I, I'm sorry. I got to quit. I'll help you find the next guy to replace me because I love Kentucky and what God's doing, but I got to move on. I don't know what God's doing. He's like, where are you going? I was like, I don't know, man. I'm carrying fridges. <laughs> leave, leave me alone. <laughs> and literally, as I'm carrying, you know, I, fi- I found out later, as I'm carrying fridges up stairwells, like one, uh, this guy contacted me later. He's like, hey, I don't know if you know me or not, but thanks for leading me to Jesus in the stairwell. I mean, God's like still doing stuff. And then, and then I call the fridge company, and I say, hey, I don't know. I know this sounds really crazy, but God told me to quit carrying fridges. I'll help you find somebody to replace me, but I don't know what God's doing. And they, I mean, they're, this company, like, led by a bunch of Jesus lovers, and so they're like, we understand you're kind of touched. <laughs> I'm telling you, like, sometimes the wisdom of God just doesn't look earthly at all people. As you follow God, people will not understand. I'm, I'm all for um, spiritual counsel. I'm, I'm all for, like, fleshing it out, and let's pray together and figure out what God's doing. But sometimes when God says, move your family in a bus, it's not pizza. Like, he says those things. So I had that conversation, stepped down from all the positions I had, all the titles I had. I, the only thing I had left was just being, just being God's. And um, we had lunch that, that afternoon with a friend of ours, and he started talking about the U of I at Urbana-Champaign, University of Illinois. And um, Kathleen and I are just meeting eyes across the table. We just knew that's what God was doing. 
and I had never looked at it before. I didn't know anything about the campus. But we just knew that's what, that's what God was doing. That's why God had, ha- had asked us to step down from everything but him. And as we started learning about the 52,000 students on that campus, um, God just started rolling the red carpet out to us to go. And um, there hasn't been Chi Alpha there in 20 years, and the churches are literally begging for us to come. Um, <laughs> we have, we have um, two really amazing cheerleaders in town. That one, one guy convinced his neighbor to sell us their house without listing it, like way below what it was, what it was worth. Um, another guy is like handing my cards out to people like, you should support this guy. <laughs> I, I mean, just like, the very first conversation we had with the superintendent of Illinois, who will be our new boss, he said, oh, you know, we own a building on campus there. Would Chi Alpha like that? Would you guys? <laughs> so, I mean, it, it really, God is like adding all the things back in our life that Satan tried to steal and, and in greater way. And as a result, we... Um, We just, we just learned that you just can't point at situations and say that was good or that was bad. That's, that, that was what Adam and Eve did in the beginning that was wrong. They tried to take on God's role. And so that's not to say you can't point at things and say scripturally that is defined as evil. That's evil. But it means that as you go through your life, you can't say, well, that was good or, well, that was bad. Because you never know how God is going to turn it around. He's a redeemer. That's what he does. So as we went through this awful, heart-wrenching, terrible situation where we lost our church family and many of our friends on the planet and our Chi Alpha and our ministry and our students that we can't even legally speak to, I mean, we lost everything, and I would literally sign up for it all again. I'd do it tomorrow because of where God took us as a result. Now, does anybody want to go through those things? No, I'm not signing up for those things on purpose. Nobody wants to go through pain. But man, God uses it. So this morning, as we take communion, thank you. You know, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And I I think what he was saying there was, see how I've poured my life out do the same we can we can make it really complicated but really all God wants from us is everything and if you go through life attached to any other thing but God it won't work If you go through life with any other thing being your solution, it it won't be enough. So your Christianity cannot just be your philosophy, how you live. You have to die and then be raised to life again. And he asks us to pour our life out so that we can live. Jesus, thank you for your bones. For your body that you gave for us. We don't take it lightly. We know that you came down here into the mess so you could sympathize when we go through mess. do this today remembering what you've done for us let's take the bread this juice represents the blood 
Jesus signed up for suffering so that we could know God. He did it on purpose because of how he knew God would redeem it in each of you. Jesus, thank you for giving your life for us. May we do likewise. Let's take the cup. God, I know everybody in this room is going to go through stuff. Help us. Help us to tear everything else off the throne but you. Every title, every position, every other calling, anything else that would take our attention, anything else that would give us purpose, anyone else who would give us a plan or who we have to live up to to please. We're here for you. Help us to be singularly focused on that heavenly wisdom that looks so crazy here on earth. And God, as we do that, we pray that people around us would see how the heavenly wisdom gets us through when nothing else can get us through. Thank you, Father, for making us sons and daughters. No other calling matters. We worship you with our lives. Amen. All right, uh, stand with me. Let me say a blessing over you, and then on your way out, if you would, make sure and drop something in the basket for the Brooks family or... Uh, give something online, send something in one way or another. Uh, let's, let's make sure that, that we tangibly say we love you. So close your eyes, put your hands out. May the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you. And all of your goings and your doings, may you be blessed in the name of Jesus. Amen. You're free to go.